Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. Jump on in. <clears throat> we are about to my colonize and get ready for a little mushroom adventure. Thank you all for joining me. I'll be your host tonight. Co-piloting is our trusty Juliana from the Harmonic Arts admin side, and she'll be answering some of the questions. Uh, but yeah, get cozy, maybe have a cup of tea. If you do have a cup of tea, let us know where you're coming from uh, and what you're drinking. So <clears throat> just to get started, um, we're going to go for like an hour and a half tonight. I'm going to just take a few minutes before we get started to let everybody jump in. Looks like we got 80 people online right now. There's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you are with us live, uh, know that you will get a recording. So take notes, but also know that you can watch this again afterwards. And second off, um, there are two different ways to engage. So the first one is the chat. So um, let up the chat. If you can hear me, say hello, jump into the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. Are you from Calgary? Are you from the island? Are you from BC, Ontario? Where are you coming from? So let us know um, in the chat. And then the other thing is to know that there's a Q&A. So there is a Q&A. <clears throat> ah. All right. Looks like the chat. Currently, the chat is disabled. Okay, well, let's see if we can get this chat going. Okay, I think we should be able to get the chat going. <clears throat> Let me see, can you see my hello? Um, looks like people are able to use the Q&A, but maybe not the chat. Um, so let's just see how we get going on here. All right, <clears throat> anyway. Um, I'm excited to be your host and to share with you all that I know, or at least as much as I can share about medicinal mushrooms. We're going to go deep. Um, yes, looks like the chat is working. All right. Let us know where you're coming from. And um, if you're drinking any tea or wine or whatever it is that you're you're drinking tonight, um, me, I've got a little bit of chaga. I'm excited because this is one of my favorite drinks in the winter. This is a chaga chai, actually. We've been making a lot of chaga chai lately because chaga is a great base. Um, instead of a black tea for a chai, we'll add a lot of the chai spices in order to kind of increase that circulation, warm us up in the winter months. And yeah, just a great drink. So hmm. <clears throat> looks like we've got some folks coming in from all over. We got from from Detroit, from Oregon, from North Vancouver, from Hamilton, from Colorado, from Granville Island, from Dawson City, from Quebec. Uh, looks like someone is drinking hibiscus. <laughs> Lemon balm, till CT from Halifax. Golden milk, awesome. Love the golden milk. That's another favorite of ours in the winter months. From Airdrie, Comox, Lethbridge, Courtney. And wow, we just keep rolling in. Winnipeg. Um, all right, from New York City. Welcome, welcome American friends. Um, Ontario, Lanceville, got some turmeric golden milk going on, Vancouver, Victoria. All right, awesome. So there's a bunch of us jumping on. Um, because it's a big group, just the uh, Q&A, remember that if you want to ask a question, please ask it in the Q&A. Um, there is a little second tab. The chat is really for us to talk amongst ourselves or for you two. You can pose questions there, but I may not answer them. They're more of a collective group answering. So if you see somebody pose a question in the chat, please try to answer as best as you can. Uh, but yeah, today I am just really excited to share with you more about mushrooms because, well, as you all know, if you know and have followed Harmonic Arts, this is something we love. We are fun guys and fun gals. We're super excited to share more on this topic, uh, as well as really to break down a bit more of an understanding on what are some of the most potent medicinal mushrooms, how can we work with them as medicine? How can we start to incorporate them into our diet? What is the future of where mushrooms can go? I don't know if any of you have seen um, Paul Stamets' TED Talk on, uh, I think it's seven ways or eight ways in which mushrooms can save the world. Well, there's lots more than that since that. That was at least eight, maybe eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. We're starting to see now mushrooms that can turn plastic into guacamole. We're seeing mushrooms that can bioremediate out toxins. We're seeing mushroom leathers and mushroom uh, packaging start to come in. I've seen mushroom gel caps now. I've seen mushroom cardboard, 3D printing with mushrooms, so much more. Um, so there's loads and loads and loads of ways in which mushrooms can support us in our overall health. It also happens to be mushroom season. So 
This is something that really, you know, on the West Coast, we haven't had a lot of rain, but really when the rain comes, we start to see these little fruiting bodies pop up. Um, I've got a few West Coast reishis here that I have um, harvested and connected with this year. We've also got a load of other amazing mushrooms. Know that as we talk about working with medicinal mushrooms, there's lots that you can work with in your local area. Most of what Harmonic Arts offers and what we want to share about today are some of the top medicinal mushrooms that we want to work with in a fruiting body format that we can provide you with sort of the best high quality extracts that are organic certified and just quality controlled and tested to really increase and optimize your health. But in general, um, as a herbalist, I'll say that working with mushrooms is something that you can start to do in your own backyard and start to incorporate into coffees, into smoothies, into teas, and so much more. So yeah, anyway, I'm excited to share more on this topic always. So please know that there is an opportunity to ask questions. We're going to try and do two Q&A blocks, one in the middle and one at the end. So please populate the Q&A with any questions as they come up. And yeah, let's get started. Looks like there's 114 of us on, and it looks like people from all over. I got last one here is from Jamaica drinking chocolate chaga. Mm, love it. Fort St. James, uh, Fort St. John, sorry. All right. Lots of people, pumpkin chai. I'm a chai fan, drinking a little chaga chai here. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to just be doing a bit of a PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to share with you my screen and you're going to let me know once that's going let's see let's get this going um all right okay here we go and voila modern mushroom medicine with your co-founder and clinical herbalist yara willard that's me um i am also known as the herbal jedi i love to share on youtube Lots of videos on the Harmonic Arts YouTube channel. You can learn more about mushrooms as well as my own personal Herbal Jedi channel. Please follow us on Instagram. Um, we've got lots of fun things around working with mushrooms and herbs and tonics and elixirs and tinctures and teas and lots of really fun ways to engage with this. So um, tonight, though, we're going to go for at least an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes of lecture and just sort of dive deep into the wood wide web, into the mycoverse, as we like to call it and um, start to connect with why we might want to work with functional mushrooms. So, um, all right, let's just make sure we are all set here. We're recording and all right, I'm just gonna, okay, perfect. So let's start with mushrooms. What are they? Well, um, technically mushrooms are actually a type of fungi, but there are lots of different kinds of fungi. There's up to 1.5 million species of fungi on planet Earth. We actually haven't cataloged them all. We're learning about new fungi all the time. There's, there's ones in our guts, there's ones in our fridge, you know, that mold on the back of something in your fridge that you should have put out a while ago. That's a type of fungi. Uh, so is the type of yeast that might produce beer or wine. Those are all fungi. But what a mushroom is, is actually a macro fungi. So similar to how we might have spirulina or chlorella are micro algaes. Many of these micro fungi don't produce fruiting bodies. So a macro fungi, just like a macro algae might be a seaweed. A macro fungi is a mushroom producing fungi. And these fruiting bodies are actually the sexual reproductive part of the organism. And just like many plants that produce flowers and seeds and berries and nuts, this is where a lot of the active chemistry is. So we're going to dive deeper into the active chemistry and why we might want to work with fruiting bodies, but really know that unless it produces a fruiting body, it's not really a mushroom. It might be a different type of fungus. So um, that candida yeast in our gut, not a mushroom. That thing in the back of our fridge, like I mentioned, not a mushroom. But if it grows out of the earth or off a tree and produces a fruiting body, like so with a little spore pad, um, whether it's a spore pad or it's sponges or it's gills, these are all mushrooms, right? So one of the beautiful things about mushrooms is that they're actually quite a bit more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And just like us, we're actually quite a bit closer related to mushrooms than we are to plants. This means that we share similar genetic heritage and therefore get similar genetic 
um, dispositions and actually work in a similar way. We breathe in oxygen and out carbon dioxide, just like mushrooms do. We also have a nervous system that is wired very similar to the way the hypha in the mycelium underground work within the mushrooms. We send these biofeedback loops quite similar. We actually show up, even though they might be in the ground or in a tree, we, we show up in a very similar way where we extract nutrients out of the environment to, in order to produce our own energy. This is very different from plants, which use chlorophyll um, to be able to extract nutrients out of the air and out of the sun, right? So mushrooms, um, actually because they're similar to us, get similar pathological conditions. This is why we start to see a lot of them work as medicine for us. So what we see is that mushrooms also get other fungal infections, like yeasts that might grow on them, like other type fungus that might parasitize them. We also see that they get bacterial infections and they get parasites and they get all kinds of uh, different microbial um, infections that they might be um, predisposed to. So one of the benefits of working with mushrooms is that, at least with many of the medicinal mushrooms, these wood-like ones, is they've actually figured out health strategies on how to deal with most of the pathogenic organisms in their ecosystem. So really, when we think about using mushrooms as medicine, remember that no herb or mushroom is a magic bullet. It is going to impart its wisdom onto you and your body is actually what does the healing, right? So the healing process is most of the time from our body healing and the mushrooms or the intelligence of the chemistry teaches our body how to heal. This is a big difference from the idea of the mushrooms heal us or the herbs us. The pharmaceuticals heal us. It's actually that they impart the chemistry that often shows our body how to heal. Now, this could be good or bad. Uh, a lot of synthetic compounds that have been produced in labs aren't, um, they don't, they're not natural in a way that they have meaning. And so they actually don't, um, often you'll get a lot more counterindications and side effects from specific individual compounds than you will from a whole spectrum extract or a whole spectrum food or mushroom in this case. So they're similar to us genetically. We understand that there's at least 10,000 species that produce mushrooms. And this is by far a guesstimate approximate. We know that there's definitely more than this. I've been in places where like there's a trail near us that I've only once in the 15 years seen a specific type of fruit that was growing a fruiting body, it was growing a mushroom under specific conditions. Now I know that mycelium lives there underground, but often we don't see these fruiting bodies, obviously we don't see them year round, but even within each season, it might be like six, seven, 10 seasons even before some of these mushrooms produce fruit. So we don't really know how many there are because we haven't been able to fully catalog them. We're learning more and more and more every year. We also understand that we probably don't know like very many, maybe 10% of the fungus species on earth have been discovered. This leads us to an understanding that because these live in these intact ecosystems, this is where we're going to find the most diversity of species in old growth forests and fully intact um, temperate and tropical rainforests. We know that if we keep these places intact, we're going to find a lot more medicine. In fact, most of the pharmaceuticals that have been created on planet Earth were originally derived from using mushroom chemistry because they're more self-similar to us than plants. We've been able to use a lot of the chemistry we found in mushrooms to create pharmaceuticals. An example is here's an oyster mushroom. This is really cool. Oyster mushroom is the original love of statin, statin drugs. So statin drugs that are good for cholesterol and um, cardiovascular health and are used that way by modern pharmaceutical industry were originally created from oyster mushrooms. We see that many times over within the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, there are mushroom pharmaceuticals based in other countries too. Uh, PSK is a pharmaceutical used from turkey tail in cancer treatment in Japan, as well as we see a one called Bifungin used from Chaga in, uh, in Russia. So there's a number like that from our medicinal mushrooms, but also just understanding that we don't have a full understanding of mushroom chemistry yet. And 
we're starting to learn more and more and more that there are a wide spectrum of species we've probably never even discovered that might have some of the best healing compounds for us. So it's a good reason to keep these intact ecosystems alive and um, a good reason to keep researching more and more on mushrooms. All right. So where are they found? Everywhere, my friends. Um, a quarter of the biomass of our planet is made up of fungus. Uh, that's a lot. Like the only other rival that makes up that much is bacteria, which makes up a little over another quarter of, of the biomass of our Earth. So if we look at um, between bacteria and fungus um, ecosystems, they make up over half the biomass of this planet. And we see them in the air. Well, we can't really see them in the air, but we're breathing in spores all the time. All around us, there's thousands of, my, of mushroom spores in every breath. So just in the time you listen to this talk, you're going to have breathed in millions of mushroom spores. Also, we see that they have the capacity to show up um, all the way up into the stratosphere. So many pollens and bacteria fall out of the atmosphere the further and further they get up, but all the way to the very top of our stratosphere, the furthest place from the earth, we see mycelial spores. We see these spores, and one thought is that potentially um, anything we send into space is dipped in this layer of mycelial spores. And maybe, just maybe, humanity's only reason for evolving these beautiful big frontal lobes is to send junk into space so that they can be dipped in Earth's seed of mycelial spores and one day land on some rock where they can regrow and Earth can regrow her own new planet. That might be the way in which a planet like planet Gaia produces seed is to use uh, uh, a brain like we have to be able to produce a sperm tail on the back end of mushroom spores. This is a thought. The other thought around this is that potentially because they can handle the hardship of space, maybe our planet was seeded originally by a uh, fungus um, living on space rocks that landed here. And actually, as we look way, way, way back into the history of, of our planet, we see that the lava rock was colonized by mycelial um, species up to 2.4 billion years ago. First, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, we thought it was 1.3 billion years ago, but recently we found some fossilized records of mycelium up to 2.4 billion years ago, eating and breaking down the lava rock. Now we know that plants only came onto land around 700 million years ago. So that's a huge gap. We're talking billions of years of mycelial nets breaking down with complex enzymatic um, excretions, the rock, in order to create some kind of ecosystem in which even lichen could grow on, and then even plants could start to evolve all the way up to where we're at now. So literally, they are terraformers and have been producing the ecosystems of this planet for a long time. So this concept is more that it's not that forests grow mushrooms, it's more that the mushrooms grow these forests to create these ecosystems for them to thrive and to genetically um, spread and to create new species and also to invite much more complex stability amongst the biodiversity of, of an intact ecosystem. And this, my friends, is where mushrooms really shine, in my opinion, is that they actually help to create these biodiverse intact ecosystems that are the immune system of our planet. All right. And so when we look to see how old some of these are, they're far older than any other organism around. They know all of the trees. They're older than many of the trees, some of them up to, well, on this slide, you can see up to eight and a half thousand years old. We see a honey mushroom in Oregon that spans 2,385 acres. This is a massive organism, and it's not alone. We found a number of these huge megalithic um, mycelial nets that when you actually, from a scientific lens, read the genetics and look at the DNA signature, you can see that these all started from one little seed set up of gram-positive, gram-negative, kundalini spiraling, sexually reproducing mycelial net. This is all genetically self-similar, meaning that they grew out over this two to 8,000 years into these huge networks. Amazing what we're seeing uh, around um, them. So they're older and wiser than any other organism on our planet. 
And that's part of the wisdom that they can share with us, both in sustainability and regenerative um, practices for our planet, but also in dealing with some of the biggest chronic diseases of our time, dealing with some of the more um, hard to work with health conditions that we're facing, things like cancer, autoimmune conditions, um, chronic illnesses, digestive inflammation, so, just so much more. All right. And even if we look into the psycho, psychedelic mushrooms, we can see working with a lot of mental health illnesses and addiction and all of this kind of stuff. Okay. So let's speak to the life cycle of a mushroom. Um, we're just going to do a few slides here on giving you, getting you orientated into where and what and how these things show up. And then we're going to get into more of the medicinals. All right. So first off, the life cycle of a mushroom is really fairly simple. It goes from a spore, which is what you're breathing in all the time. You can't really see them, but they're also in the rain clouds. Um, coming down with the rain, these spores will land on Earth. When they land into the right ecosystem, gram-positive and gram-negative spores will come together. And you'll get all kinds of gram-positive, gram-positive relationships, gram-negative, gram-negative relationships. They're very fluid, gender, gender fluid. Um, and they do start to build these webs, which are kind of like this dance. And as they as they build these webs, they create this mycelium. This mycelium, as the ecosystem um, creates the right environment for them, aka uh, enough warmth, they start to run, enough water, they start to reproduce. As they get more and more um, reproductive, they build these little primordia, which is the underground kind of button that starts to build before it erupts into a fruiting body. Now the fruiting bodies are designed to have kind of a rain protection on all of them will have like a top layer to them. Uh, here's a good example right here. You can see like this top layer to protect the spores, whether they're in gills or sponges or polypores like this one is, in order for that inside to be able to start to produce more of these spores, right? So basic life cycle of a mushroom, just remember that this is like the apple on a tree and the real organism lives underground. Okay, now there is a big difference between fruiting body and mycelium. This is something I like to share a bit about because the sheer fact of the matter is, is that they're being sold in the market as the same thing, and they're not the same thing. The fruiting body, like I had mentioned, is the reproductive part of the underground organism. And because of that, it produces a much wider spectrum of chemistry. It's sort of like thinking about a flower, a seed, a fruit, uh, a nut, how much more diverse the chemistry is in that than the branch or the leaf on, the, on, a, on, a, on a tree. Um, so what we see is that currently in North America, a lot of producers who are growing mushrooms are actually growing what are called mycelial blocks. And these mycelial blocks are then being turned into capsules or into powders and being considered like mushrooms. They're very different. Most mycelium have a good amount of branched polysaccharides and beta-glucans in them. And these compounds are the active immunomodulating ones that we see in the fruiting bodies that have been used and worked with for thousands of years. Uh, but they're a little different in the sense that they don't have as wide of a spectrum of, my, of, of the branched polysaccharides. In like reishi alone, there's over 400 different types of branched polysaccharides in the fruiting body, but in the mycelium, there's less than 100. So there's quite a lower spectrum of these. There's still a lot. There's a wide amount of mycelium uh, uh, type of polysaccharides, and they work to protect the mycelium from outside pathogens in their ecosystem. So they have some benefit to us, but they're quite different from what's in the fruiting bodies. And so this is a big thing in our industry because, you know, when I first started working with mushrooms, I really wanted to work with what I thought was going to be great mushrooms and they were a mycelium underground. And I thought they were great. And I started eating them and they all were tasting quite similar, all very much like sawdusty kind of wood, very bland flavored. I tinctured them. I, um, I tried to extract them in every different way. And, you know, when I make chaga tea versus reishi tea, I get these really unique uh, beautiful profile flavors that are quite diverse from each other. When I eat lion's mane, I get quite a different flavor. When I chew on cordyceps, I get quite a different flavor. Whereas on the mycelium, I was getting all the same flavors. So just for my own intuition, it's like this is a bit of a crime against wisdom, we'll call it, to think that these have really wide spectrum of bioactive chemistry and unique profiles when they all taste quite similar. And sure enough, 
reading into the science, it looks like the compounds that a lot of these mushrooms are known for are some of these other compounds, not just the branch polysaccharides. So we're seeing things like polyphenols, the triterpenes, these ergosterols, a bunch of these type of um, even diterpenes that are in some of the lion's mane, uh, like the hericinones and arinocines, the um, cordycepine and compounds like that in the cordyceps, the various types of ganodermic acids in the reishi. These are what stimulate some of the more unique profiles of what we see about mushrooms. When we think of reishi as grounding, well, often it's these terpene groups, the longevity enhancing qualities of these terpene groups. The um, cardiovascular protective qualities are these terpene groups. Some of the antiviral properties are these terpene groups, right? So we also see a lot of antioxidants in fruiting bodies. Remember that they want to protect themselves. And in the spores is where we see a lot of these terpene groups. These are smaller chemistry than, than the branch polysaccharides. And so really why I'm sharing this is because there's a big difference in the world of mushrooms. And one of the reasons we switched over from working with mycelium, which is what in the early, early days of harmonic arts I was working with because I thought those were the best because they were grown in Washington state in a beautiful um, farm setting. I thought this was amazing. Unfortunately, they don't have all the bioactives. And so we've learned, and really when you think about it, thousands of years of working with medicinal mushrooms in, in Chinese TCM literature, there's over 2000 years of history, over 4,000 years of of history actually in 2000 years of written history and working with reishi fruiting body never once has the mycelium been mentioned maybe we couldn't have harvested it then but the reality is is that the clinical data the folklore data and the scientific data all line up to show much more active um potent health benefits from working with fruiting bodies than mycelium not to say that mycelium is bad just that it should be ca categorized as something a little different all right um remember that that is the overall organism and it's the reproductive part that is the fruiting body and that's where we see a lot of this advanced chemistry and that's what we eat that's what we've worked with for a long time so um within this i wanted to share with you a bit about um the extraction process at harmonic arts we make a dual extracted or a steam extracted um or a, like a water or a water and alcohol extracted powder uh and we do this because it actually creates a much more concentrated format of the mushrooms in order for you to not have to take as much. Remember the mushrooms, we could consider them food. You know, here's a lion's mane. Um, and this lion's mane, in order to get health benefits, I'd want to eat this whole thing. Now, if I'm taking lion's mane as a capsule and it's just a one-to-one -one extract or a powder, I'm not getting that much benefits out of two capsules of this. So making a concentrated extract that's full spectrum, so it has all the qualities and all the compounds within the lion's mane, but also is, a, I think, 7 to 1, 8 to 1, 9 to 1, 12 to 1 extracts, we start to get those benefits in two capsules, in three capsules, in a quarter teaspoon of powder, in a tincture dropper full, right? We need to think of them as kind of like food in a way. You need a good amount. And lion's mane in particular is one that you actually, to see many of the therapeutic benefits, and if you look at the clinical data of what's actually being used clinically, we see that it's pretty big volumes of lion's mane, as well as some of these other mushrooms or these extracts. So what we started to work with is dialing in doing a decoction, which is a hot water extract. This break, breaks open the lignans, makes it bioavailable so that the polysaccharides can be absorbed and doing an alcohol extract. And the alcohol extract pulls in those polyphenols, those ergosterols, those in the case of reishi, the ganoderbic acids or triterpenes. In the case of like chaga, we get the betulinic acid in there and the concentrated uh, different types of compounds that we might find in the alcohol extract. We put those two together and evaporate that off in something called a vacuum tube dehydrator. Now this is really just changing the atmospheric pressure so that it boils at room temperature without um, denaturing the chemistry. So in this case, we're reducing a liquid down to a powder, almost like thinking of a juice powder, but we're evaporating it off at room temperature under a vacuum in order for it to dehydrate and then spray dried into a powder that makes it really bioavailable and easy for you to work with. This is some of the best mushroom tech out there. And, um, you know, I've visited these facilities and I've totally checked out 
um, brought our camera crew. You can actually check out on our YouTube videos at Harmonic Arts, some of the footage of the facility that does the extraction. And it's really amazing actually to see um, how this is done. And this is to me the most sophisticated slash best way to really pull in the bioactive compounds into a format that's easy for us to work with. So after, you know, sampling mushrooms from hundreds of different suppliers, after asking all these tough questions, after finding out double, you know, um, kind of control, doing lab tests on our own, asking where they're grown, what they're growing on, what substrates are growing on, all of these kinds of things, we've found what I consider to be the best quality mushrooms on planet Earth um, that are able to be worked with. And so we're really happy to be able to provide those to you when you work with Harmonic Arts products. Okay, so let's talk about the world's top medicinal mushrooms and get sort of deeper into some of the benefits of each individual mushroom. And yeah, but before we do that, I'm just going to jump in and see if there's any Q and A's I can ask um, or I can answer um, just to kind of give you guys a little, and I'll stop my screen share for a second, go back to me. Sorry if I'm a little dark. It's kind of maybe the background here. Um, it's a little dark, so hopefully I'm coming through clean. But first question, I'm just going to jump in quickly, is from Chris. And by the way, ask more questions in the Q&A. I've spent the last 20 years obsessing over mushrooms. In fact, I have a daughter. Her name is Reishi. She's 22 years old. So you can tell how long I've been into this. Um, and yeah, I've got lots of different little tidbits I can maybe share with you. So Chris Ward is asking, what is Health Canada's view on chaga mushroom ingredients? Health Canada is a tricky, tricky beast. They are changing all the time. One of the challenges is that uh, they keep turning over staff. And as far as getting site licenses and working with NPNs, which are the natural product numbers, it really depends on the year how you're going to get treated by Health Canada. One of the biggest things that they're starting to look at now is that some of these mushrooms, they want to consider them novel foods, which means in order to work with them, you need to get a site license and an NPN for the product. This is posing a lot of problems because chaga, as you may know, tastes amazing. It's got vanillic acids in it, makes a great tea. Um, so it's an easy one to work with just in making tea, but also in doing products like a chocolate bar or a mushroom drinking chocolate. It's perfect, but that's more of a food. And yet Health Canada is considering it a novel food now, which needs a site license and is a little different. So it's kind of in this gray area right now. Many of these mushrooms are getting turned over to, hey, guess what? You actually need to have site licenses and NPNs um, in order to work with them in general, even though they really should be in the food category more so than the supplement category, because they have very gentle chemistry and they can be consumed like foods. So hopefully that helps answer that a little bit. Um, Chris? Okay. So next question is from Arthur. And um, thank you, Arthur, for this. In making tincture, which is more, which has more potent, the fruiting body or the mycelium? Stamet uses almost mycelium exclusively, but others use only the fruiting body. Uh, it's confusing. You're darn right it's confusing, Arthur. Um, it's challenging. I think Stamets, um, I'm, I'm, it's to me, like, I really think he's done one of the best jobs of supporting mushrooms in general as a whole movement. But, you know, the fruiting bodies are where all the science is. You know, I, I spent time at the medicinal mushroom uh, symposium or mushroom conference in Nantung, China in 2019. There were 62 different countries that came and brought their scientific literature and papers of all the new studies that have been done in the last two years. And it's all on fruiting bodies and the benefits of fruiting bodies and showing how to extract them, how to get these compounds out of them and why those have a lot of the bioactives. So realistically, you should be using fruiting bodies, not mycelia. Um, the challenge is, is that mycelia are very economical to grow. And because you see branch polysaccharides in them, the logic goes to say, oh, well, because they have branch polysaccharides, I can totally work with these in the same way I would work with fruiting bodies that also have branch polysaccharides. But really when you dig into it, you see that it's not as diverse of chemistry and that it doesn't have any of the other bioactives. And those are much of the benefit that is kind of lost when you just work with a mycelium versus fruiting body extract. The other thing to think about is, uh, this is actually a lion's mane I grew right here at home and on a fruiting body, on a fruiting block. This mushroom grew on a fruiting block that was 10 to 15 times the size of it. So 
there's 10 to 15 times the amount of mycelium to fruiting body. Now I might get two flushes, maybe three flushes of fruit out of that, but you have to understand that from a cost benefit ratio of a business, using mycelium is far more economical than using fruiting bodies, right? Because you got 10 to 15 times as much weight um, that you can work with. So this is one of the challenges that I have with the whole industry. I think that there is benefits to mycelium, but they need to be categorized as two different things. They're not actually mushrooms. They are the mycelium. So anyway, that's a little bit on that. Um, Arthur, honestly, if I was making a tincture and I make lots of mushroom tinctures, work with the fruiting body, make an extract of the a water extract and an alcohol extract as strong as you possibly can, put the two together. That's the best way. That's how we work with it at Harmonic Arts. Those are the type of tinctures we make and they're super potent. Uh, many people comment on how potent our tinctures are. They're awesome. They have many of those bioactives and they're just a better way to work with in that sense. Okay. Pam is asking, um, where are the mushroom fruity bodies getting their unique chemistry profile if not from the mycelium? Great, great question. So they're obviously, it's sort of like, um, let's, I want to use a different example. Let's use a tomato, okay? There's loads of active chemistry in tomato leaves, but they are poisonous. Whereas the tomato fruiting body produces a really highly concentrated red fruit that is high in antioxidants. Lycopene is the main one in tomatoes. And you have to understand that they're pulling this out of the ground or out of the substrate, and they're transmuting the chemistry into that lycopene and into that um, chemistry that's quite edible and delicious in a tomato. Right. So, yes, there are compounds in the um, leaves, but there are also a lot of anti herbivore compounds in the leaves because they don't want herbivores to eat them, but they do want herbivores to eat the fruiting bodies because they have all their seeds and they transfer it on forward. So, it's not the same with plants as mushrooms, but understanding that they're getting this unique chemistry from the substrates that they're growing on. So this is one of the things that's also really important, Pam, and, and any of you, is what is the actual mushroom growing on? You know, in the case, this picture behind me is one of the farms that we work with. This is a farm that these reishis are growing on downwood logs, which is really a type of basswood that they, they lay underground and then put leaf litter and dirt on top of it and pack it into the ground. So they're actually not growing off the dirt. They're growing off the logs that have been buried underground. And these logs have the chemistry that the mycelium is able to extract and turn into high quality triterpenes that we're going to see in the fruity bodies. So by growing them on logs, reishi anyway, you get far more diversity and quality of these terpene groups and of these polyphenol groups. So really where they're getting their chemistry from is from the substrates that they're grown on. Now you can grow on great substrates, just mycelium. It's just that until the mycelium turns into fruit, it doesn't need to produce these other bioactives to protect the fruit and to transfer into the next generation seed. Another example I would give is the seed of an apple has all of the intelligence to grow an entirely new apple tree right? Just like the seed of the mycelium has all the intelligence to grow an entirely new uh, whole wood wide web that might be thousands of years old and hundreds if not thousands of acres wide one day. Uh, so it's, it's packing all of its intelligence. And this is so true of all plants as well. Most of our best herbs and best plants, fruits and their seeds and their flowers that we like to work with. Now, there's plenty, too, that concentrate that into their roots. And we have a lot of our adaptogens that are roots and some that are leaves, too. So there's great chemistry all through this universe and all through um, the ecosystem. Just know that the fruiting bodies and the reproductive organs of both plants and mushrooms are where they put their most advanced chemistry, typically, right? We see that all the same with um, many, many fruits and many plants that way, too. Their best chemistry, they save it for the next generation, just like humans do. All of our crazy um, hormones that we produce. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here, but just know that um, all the hormones and all the reproductive uh, different types of things that we do is all for the next generation. We produce a lot of advanced chemistry in our bodies just to be able to reproduce. We go to nightclubs at 3 a.m. to drink God knows what in order to find a mate. No, all these rituals we go through, all these hazings, 
it's all about the next generation, right? That's where the best stuff in life is in that, uh, yeah, reproductive thing. Okay. Um, next question from Pam really quickly here is, is there significance or any difference in potency between fresh and dried mushrooms if eating raw or extracting? Yeah, first off, Pam, don't eat raw mushrooms. Uh, really, we don't want to eat raw mushrooms. We want to, even those button mushrooms, you want to cook them down. There's lignans and chitins that are kind of hard on the digestive tract. Make sure you heat them up a little bit in order to, which is a form of extracting them, just frying them with onions for, for fruiting bodies that you might eat like oyster mushrooms or shiitakes or button mushrooms. You want to make sure you're extracting them a little bit, breaking down the lignans and chitin so that they're more bioavailable and the chemistry comes out. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely a difference. Most mushrooms that are made into medicine are dried first. It concentrates them. Um, even with psychedelic mushrooms that people take, eating them fresh from what I've been, so I've been told, eating them fresh is far less potent than eating them dried. Um, but same thing with reishi mushroom, lion's mane. I've eaten fresh lion's mane and it's delicious, but you do get more concentration when you dry it out. Okay, I got one last question. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer two more questions, and then we're gonna jump back into each one. Um, Dennis's question um, is: How does this process compare to micronizing? So micronizing is kind of like breaking it down into a smaller format and heat treating it. Right. Um, this format is is not bad for extracting mycelium, but it's far different from basically turning it into a liquid which is what we're doing with a dual extraction process of making a tea and making an alcohol extract and then reducing down that liquid. So instead of it being like a ground up powder that we've put through a toaster oven, literally is what's happening with a lot of micronizing. And with that type of thing is we're putting a ground up powder, fine, fine ground up powder through a heat treatment um, and then eating the powder. We're still eating the mushroom itself. What we're doing now is we're taking the bioactives bringing them into a liquid, removing some of that fiber and some of that um, non-medicinal part, and then concentrating down the liquid. So instead of it being a one-to-one, -one, which is what a micronize is still, it's still a one-to-one -one where we have one gram of this fruiting body is still one gram of toasted, powdered, ground up, more bioavailable form out of this. What we're now taking is that seven grams of this fruiting body transferring that into a liquid and reducing it back down to one gram. So we only need one gram to get seven times as much and it's more bioavailable and it's in the format that is a fruiting body, meaning that the chemistry is more bioactive and more diverse. Okay, um, last question I'll ans uh, answer from uh, Stella. Actually, two more questions I'll answer here, but from Stella is, can you use these mushrooms during pregnancy and breastfeeding? Which ones? So um, typically the first three months of pregnancy, I'm like, don't do anything like that. Um, obviously you may wanna talk to a midwife or a doula if they know this kind of stuff. Many women I know have used medicinal mushrooms like chaga and reishi during breastfeeding and during pregnancy. Um, they're fairly common. I wouldn't wanna use huge, huge volumes, but know that these are quite safe and gentle and, and they've been used by a lot of people that way as a way to protect their immune system when they can't use some of the herbs that are counterindicated. So I've known a lot of kids too that in an early age are drinking chaga tea even. Um, we've had our kids drinking chaga tea since they were two years old, uh, but at the same time, mama's been drinking chaga tea when she's breastfeeding in order to kind of keep her immune system up during these cold and flu months. So reishi, chaga, turkey tail, lion's mane, those would be the four that I would look to. Cordyceps, not such a big deal, but you don't really need it. And it's not one that would be like really used. But if you had a five mushroom blend, I would say no problem during the second and third trimester of pregnancy and during breastfeeding. Okay, or at least in my family's experience, that's been the case and in what many people have told me. So last question I'm gonna answer is from LD and I wanted to answer this one because it's about to come up uh, and it always does is, do your mushroom, do you get any mushrooms from China? And the answer is yes, we do. And this is part of the thing. This was an existential crisis for me originally, wanting to not source things from China and yet understanding that they are the primary place in which 
mushrooms are cultivated and worked with on this planet. Uh, they have the most history as well as knowledge, as well as scientific literature around working with mushrooms. They've got the best tech for extracting mushrooms, and they've been doing it as part of their tradition for over 4,000 years. So understanding all of that, realized that, okay, unless somebody in North America is able to properly produce a high quality fruiting body in the volumes that we want to work with, we can't source from here. So we spent a number of years actually going through and asking questions to the various sources, trying to find fruiting bodies, because we knew that we wanted to work with fruiting bodies from other places besides working with China. And at the end of the day, it comes down to there's nobody doing that in volume and that we can actually work with and then be able to, to work with here in North America. So we had to go through and find and vet like 20, 30 different suppliers of mushrooms, um, get some lab results, do third-party testing, go and visit the facilities, actually bring a video crew, look at the farms, check out the earth, check out the quality of the substrates and do all of that due diligence in order to make sure that we have the best quality mushrooms. And when I got to China, one of the things that blew me away was that there are like in the markets, there's like 18 different grades of reishi, just reishi alone. And this, this blew me away because it comes down to the fact that this mushroom has many different ways in which you can produce it and grow it to get these active compounds. And um, so really what we work with is the best quality extracts that come out of Asia. Um, and some of them are grown in Siberia. Some of them are grown in Russia. Some of them are grown in northern China. And, and the places we were able to go see the farms we work with are mostly in remote locations. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that as we go along. But just know that, um, yes, and I think that China is not all bad. They pride themselves on their mushrooms. And one of the things that's a big issue that we ran into is that, you know, North America basically gave China all of its garbage to produce. And then now we complain about how toxic China is um, because they're producing all of our garbage and all of our recycling. And there's loads of really toxic, bad ethical practices in China. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of problems with that. At the same time, TCM, Chinese medicine, is one of their most prized, uh, I'll say cultural treasures. And medicinal mushrooms, like reishi, 90% of the world's reishi is consumed inside of Asia. It's in teas and coffees and everything there. Like there's statues in the local towns with, with monks holding these mushrooms. The, the emperor's throne has mushrooms on it in the Forbidden City. It's very much a part, a rich part of their culture. And so just like anything that's in demand, they produce the highest quality mushrooms in the world, as well as uh, counterfeit products, poor quality, low quality um, stuff as well. So you just got to know your sources, get to know um, who you're working with and really do that vertical transparency. And so, yeah, I'm actually proud to say that our mushrooms are from China or some of them are because we've vetted who's growing them, how they're being grown and what they're being grown on. And we know that those are the best quality extracts on the planet. Okay. So... Let's talk about some mushrooms. Okay, thanks for those of you who maybe didn't want to sit through Q&A. Thanks for the questions. Please ask more questions. I'm super keen to make this about what you want to learn, not just what I want to share about mushrooms here. So let's keep diving in. Okay, so um, first off, this is just a fun one. What mushroom personality are you, my friends? And I'd love for you to light up the chat. Um, what personality do you think you are? Are you a dynamic, protective, adventurous chaga person? Are you a trusting foodie, a resilient turkey tail person? Are you a athletic, high energy driven cordyceps person? Are you a creative, great hair, optimistic lion's mane person? Or are you a grounded, spiritual, big hearted reishi person? So light up the chat with what you think you are. And I know there's gonna be a bunch of you saying, I am all of them. Can't I be two or three? Let's, uh, let's try to see if you can, tool it down to like one or two. What mushroom personality do you think you are? I see some chaga, I see some reishi in here. I see a lion's mane and cordyceps person, a turkey tail, definitely a multi-mushroom, some folks. Um, yeah, anyway, this is just a fun little slide that we put on Instagram and um, which is one of the things that we share is like some fun things like this, turkey tail. <coughs> Looks like we've got a bunch of lion's mane, reishi, turkey tail, chaga, 
I've got all of them. I'm seeing a lot of turkey saps. I like that one. Some chaga. Awesome. Okay, keep lighting up the chat. What is it that you think you are? I'll tell you, um, I like to think of myself as um, optimistic, lion's mane but I'm also very adventurous, chaga -y, and I want to be grounded, but I'm definitely spiritual, so I'm a bit of reishi, so I'd, I'd like to be all of them as well. Okay, so let's talk about reishi to begin with. All right, reishi is probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous mushroom of our time. This one has so much, uh, I guess, different types of um, like nicknames for it. My favorite these days is called spiritual or yeah, spiritual vegetable meat. I love that name because it kind of is like vegetable meat. It's not a vegetable. It's not a meat. It's a spiritual vegetable meat. And this comes from a Chinese fable of um, really consuming this, thinking of it as like a plant that grew out of the ground that looked like a hand. But when you consumed it, it brought you enlightenment. So it brought you the spiritual potency. Another nickname for this is meditation in a bottle or herb of spiritual potency or mushroom of immortality. These are all some of the fables around it. It is definitely the most popular mushroom in Asia. Uh, and really it's been used for a long time. We're talking, well, over 2000 years of history in TCM, but up to 4,000 years of history of this mushroom actually being used as medicine. Now, when we dive into the literature, we see that no other mushroom or even natural substance has been studied as much as reishi. Reishi is by far the most heavily studied natural substance on our planet. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars put into this. So here's something that, you know, don't take my word for it. Go on to PubMed or go on to academia or wherever you want to look up info and you will find thousands of papers, thousands of clinical trials, loads of content on working with this mushroom. Because it's been so heavily studied, we've learned a lot about it. One of the things is, is it has over 400 different types of polysaccharides. It's got over 120 types of triterpene groups, including a wide spectrum of these ganodermic acids. And depending on the strain of reishi or what it's grown on, we see different volumes of these different types of triterpenes in different amounts. So not all reishis are the same. When I was in China, they I was at the reishi museum and there was over 73 different types of reishi that they had cataloged. And the beauty of this, this Ganoderma family, and Ganoderma just means shiny skin, is really what it is, Gano, shiny, derma, skin. And these shiny skin Ganoderma mushrooms grow in every intact ecosystem around our planet. Every temperate or tropical rainforest has some form of Ganoderma. One of the ones that's around here is this one, it's called Artist Conch. And Artist Conch, you know, can produce, actually I got one here that I actually have some art on. This is, let's see if we can get it in there. Maybe you can see it. I'm really small in the corner here. So this is just herbal medicine and community I've made art on. These Artist Conchs are one of our local reishis. Another one is our Ganoderma organensi or in the East Coast, Ganoderma suja. And so these are growing in every temperate tropical kind of forest that has good sized trees. We're gonna see a lot of these, right? Anyway, so reishi is one of those mushrooms that is considered to be uh, like the idea of meditation in a bottle, grounding, bringing us back into our bodies. This concept of bringing us back into coherence with our ecosystem, with our whole holobiont or who we are, our entire um, hollow genome, which is really all the organisms living on and in us, as well as our cells, bringing us more into coherence as a community. Think of yourself as an ecosystem, and reishi helps to calm down the overwhelm in the ecosystem. So this means that it's great for all kinds of health benefits, including things like lowering blood pressure, right? When we're high blood pressure or calming down heart palpitations, all kinds of cardiovascular support, lowering cholesterol levels. We also see because it's so antioxidant rich, that it helps to really support against inflammation in the body. 
Another big part is because it calms down the overwhelm, it actually has some antihistamine compounds that relax the lungs and help us with asthma and allergies and to open up the bronchioles and to slow down and relax the body. Now, it's not just the body Reishi works on, it has a great benefit to working on the mind. So here we have a mushroom that can help protect us from our own mind in a sense of circular thinking, insomnia, um, overthinking, these kinds of things. We see Reishi as one of the primary mushrooms to support us with ADD and um, overthinking, the monkey mind, that constant churning. Reishi, like I said, meditation in a bottle can help calm down the overwhelm in our body. And with this, it also helps pull out some of the bioactive toxins in our system, like radiation, uh, like heavy metals. We see that it's great for supporting the liver and pulling out some of these radioactive isotopes and all of this kind of stuff. So by far, by far, by far, by far, if I could give one mushroom to everyone, I literally put reishi in the water supply of this whole planet if I could. And actually it is in the water supply of every temperate rainforest. So it gives you a little clue um, this is a very valuable medicine teacher on our planet. I consider this kind of like the Merlin mushroom. It is the wise sage or uh, the wise witch of the West in that sense, calming down the overwhelm. All right. Um, yeah. And I, and I, like I said, I have a daughter, she's 22 named Reishi, been a big fan of this mushroom for a long time, consumed probably my body weight in Reishi by now. Um, and just think that it's, one of the best mushrooms that really helps work with the modern age. One more benefit I've seen from it is it's great when we spend time on our pocket gods in our screen metaverses and whatever fractal realities we live in these days. Because it calms down the overwhelm in the mind, it can help pull us back out of that and just be really good to protect us from EMFs and from all this kind of stuff that we're exposing ourselves to. We just don't know where we're going these days with all that. Okay. So that's Reishi in a nutshell, um, helping bring you back into your body or helping bring us back into our bodies and calming down overwhelm, making it also great for inflammation, cardiovascular, liver, lungs, heart, mind, and so much more. Okay, so um, this is the actual Reishi farm in China that we work with that I got a chance to, or one of them, the one in the background is another one that we work with. Here, though, um, is up in the Nine Dragon Mountains, and it's beautiful. It's it's way up. You can't see it because it's under shade tents here, but these mushrooms are buried. The logs are buried underground. They're Danwood logs, and they produce some of the most bioactive, beautiful chemistry that reishi can produce. Um, the shade tent mirror forests because they're higher in the mountains, and they're also higher in the mountains to keep them away from any kind of environmental toxins that might be in the water stream way down by the cities. So when we went to this farm, it was a good five hours by bus way up into the hills to try and get to this farm. And it's just beautiful, really great, pristine environment in the Nine Dragon Mountains, just gorgeous. All right, so next mushroom we're gonna talk about is chaga. Chaga has become probably the most popular mushroom of our time. Well, I'm one of the most popular. Actually, lion's mane is now more popular. But Chaga got a lot of fame maybe about eight, ten years ago when a lot of science was done on it, a couple of books put out on Chaga. And because it tastes so good, this has those vanillic acids in it. It's super antioxidant. One of the most antioxidant-rich mushrooms we've come across. High on the ORAC scale, which is a way we measure antioxidants through the roof, really, literally the one of the most potent antioxidants we've ever found on planet Earth, and it concentrates the betulinic acid. So here's where using a chaga fruiting body also becomes really beneficial because the fruiting bodies grow on birch, and the birch trees, con they concentrate the betulinic acid out of the birch, and they concentrate some of the compounds out of the birch. So unless it's grown on the right um, tree or substrate, you're not going to get a lot of those bioactives that are in there in chaga. Now, you do want to um, make sure that chaga is ethically sourced. This is a bit of a kickback on all of the chaga craze that people have had in the last few years is that 
Well, guess what? If everybody goes out and harvests chaga and it takes like 15 years to grow somebody's chaga, what is the sustainability factors there? This is one of the reasons that we actually work with a farm in Siberia for our chaga. They have figured out how to cultivate it in a sustainable way. So they have these large forests that are considered organic certified because they don't have any toxins or industry anywhere near them. And what they do is they make these small notches in some of the bigger, older trees and they sprinkle little bits of the black chaga all around it to help encourage chaga to grow into those notches and then they harvest it out of that. So they've been doing this for a number of years and now are creating a much more sustainable chaga harvesting method. This is part of the reason we work with this chaga. The other thing about this mushroom is not only is it antioxidant, it's very anti-inflammatory in the gut. So here's a great one for cancers of the digestive tract and for inflammation in the digestive tract and things like SIBO or um, small bacterial overgrowth, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or candida. Here's one that can calm down inflammation from glyphosate or Roundup Ready wheat and all of the toxins in our foodscape. A lot of people have become highly sensitively, sensitive digestively due to the um, basically the glyphosate Roundup Ready foods that we're eating that are killing our true microbiome and causing a lot of inflammation and a lot of allergies in our bodies and a lot of autoimmune conditions that are coming up in the modern world. And a lot of this has to do with the foodscape that's surrounding us now. So Chaga to the Rescue has a great opportunity to support us with all of those types of things. But it's also, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, there's a pharmaceutical called Bifungin out of Russia that is made out of Chaga. And here's one that's just been used now for quite a while to work with cancer treatment. So a lot of people going through um, any kind of tumor protocol or cancer treatment, when they start to Google mushrooms, they'll come up with, they'll hear from anecdotal evidence from folks using chaga. A lot of folks use chaga tea. It's a great, great um, support adjunctive to doing something like our five mushroom blend. And I would highly recommend using uh, mushroom extract powders because they're far more potent than just one to one, extra, one to one mushrooms or mushroom mycelia. Using the extract powders of fruiting body is where most of the science is and where you're going to get a lot of those benefits if you're trying to deal with some kind of deeper chronic um, or uh, tumor type system. So, and as well as like autoimmune stuff too coming up. So I mentioned the triterpenes of bet betulinic acid and some of the other compounds. They're very antiviral in chaga. Um, so we have some, you know, long COVID support here in a way that here's one that can support retrovirus stuff coming back as well as it's anti-inflammatory in the gut. And some of the new science I've been reading on that is people who get the long COVID often have poor microbiome health and microbiome diversity. So many of these mushrooms are prebiotic. So they really have this function in supporting the microbiome. So not only is it antiviral, it's also gonna support the microbiome and in that way, strengthen the innate overall immune system of the human. And so just like, why wouldn't you be working with mushrooms like this? Okay, favorite thing of mine though about chaga, and I like to drink a lot of chaga tea, the chaga chai that I'm having now, uh, is that it's stabilizing to the blood sugar. It helps if you haven't, if you're fasting or if you're in between meals, drinking a bit of chaga tea is a really great way to kind of stabilize blood sugar. It tastes good. It's a great base for your elixirs, your lattes, your herbal lattes and all that stuff. But it also makes a great just way to intermittent fast drinking chaga tea. Okie dokie. So let's talk about probably the most, like I mentioned, the most popular mushroom of our time these days is lion's mane. Um, this one, you know, took the world by storm. I'd say about five, six years ago, lion's mane started to get hype and it's just nonstop. People want that edge. They want that edge over their ecosystem, over their brain. Most of us are one of 50 shades of crazy if we live in the modern world. And there's a lot of overwhelm, a lot of marketing and media and fast stuff coming at us. We don't remember very well. We're too distracted all the time. So lion's mane is supporting people in stimulating new nerve growth factors. So most people taking lion's mane, it's actually just to increase their memory and to support them with having a bit of an edge and as a um, in, in having better brain function. But the reality is, is that most of the science around lion's mane is used for things like dementia and Alzheimer's and more neurodegenerative diseases 
like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's. So as a preventative, but also for people working with that. I will say though, um, people who think they're going to get great benefits from lion's mane need to take more. Uh, a lot of times people aren't. All the science I've read in some of these like clinical guides and stuff around working with it, it's like six grams of lion's mane minimum. So, you know, and this is true of people I've heard from anecdotal evidence. I was doing a class in Edmonton not too long ago, um, just, just recently actually in September. And one of the women in the class mentioned how she um, had like the dentist had killed the nerve on her tooth. And I was like, I'm sorry, we killed the nerve. We never do this. Like, this is like this only the second time in my career this has happened. She was eating lion's mane and started to get more pain back in that spot. And was like, I think the nerve's alive. It's like, well, we, it was dead. We we're sure it's dead. She regrew back the nerve in her tooth from using lion's mane. I've heard similar stories from people who were in car accidents that couldn't speak or pick up a cup, um, consuming big volumes of lion's mane and starting to regrow these nerves back. So I'm not saying this is what's gonna happen to you, but know that um, there are some good anecdotal evidence and most of the time it's from people consuming tablespoons of like an extract powder, not taking two capsules of uh, mycelium and thinking they're going to get those kind of results. So <clears throat> just word to the wise, make sure you take enough if you're going to work with lion's mane. It is like a food. And or if you just want to use it for a little bit of mental clarity to help improve anxiety and to work with a bit of seasonal affective depression, then a couple of capsules a day is perfect maintenance dose. I love consuming a good volume of lion's mane only because it makes me feel happy. It's like this happy mushroom. When I take a teaspoon of it, I'm like, wow, you know, I feel kind of lit up. My brain is functioning a bit better and my eyes are, are seeing a little bit brighter colors and I'm just in a good mood most of the time. And it helps to reduce anxiety. So if anything, to me, all of those are great, great benefits to just taking it as a maintenance dose, let alone, um, trying to actually use it therapeutically for a neurodegenerative disease where we're starting to see some good science coming out around that. Again, though, bigger volumes than most people think they should be taking. Okay. Next mushroom. Oh, there's a picture of lion's mane. I forgot. This is the lion's mane farm we work with. This is in, um, this is in Gutan. Gutan is a part of China that is actually um, known as ancient mushroom farm. And it's, it's, it's into the heart of China. It's a beautiful big open valley with nice tree line above, very clean, very clean environment. They do grow a lot of mushrooms there. These are up in some of the shade tents near the top of that. They create these, um, these kind of uh, sawdust wood uh, logs that they then produce these fruiting bodies, inoculate them with the mycelium and produce these fruiting bodies. So these ones I'm actually holding, we got to eat that day in a soup that we made um, or that the chef for us made. Um, but the reality is, is that um, the best quality fruiting body extracts are, are come from the best quality fruiting bodies. And so we were able to source from one of these um, farms in Nantung that's fairly far up into the ecosystem and just as this beautiful place with some lovely farmers that are working with it. And that's the actual lion's mane that we work with. Okay. <clears throat> So turkey tail, this one is known as hiker's mushroom. It's everywhere. If you live on the West Coast, you've seen this in the forest. Um, this grows in lots of places all through. I've seen it in uh, down South, Southern America, Central America, Europe, uh, seen it out Eastern Canada. There's a load of turkey tail everywhere. So it's the one of these that you're most likely to see when you go for a walk in the woods. And turkey tail is the second most heavily studied mushroom on the planet. Um, I've got a little turkey tail here. It is this Coriolis versicolor or Trimedes versicolor because it has this turkey like kind of versicolor and they're very velvety on the top and then they are white, kind of iridescent white on the bottom. The reality is, is that turkey tail is easy to find, um, but it's hard. You can't just eat it, right? You need to make it into a tea or an extract. And because this is so heavily studied, it's one of those ones that we know a lot about as well. Uh, it's got some similar properties to reishi. It's not grounding in the same way, but it has these immunomodulating, liver protective, gut protective, anti-cancer properties. So quite prebiotic, great for inflammation in the gut, quite supportive for the liver, and has some antiviral polyphenol groups in it. But its big claim to fame is that turkey tail has been heavily used with cancer and chemo treatments. 
there's one study I saw that up to 400 times better recovery rate from using turkey tail alongside chemotherapy. That's huge. That's much better recovery rate than just taking conventional chemotherapy. So um, why wouldn't you use turkey tail alongside of it? There's an extract in, in um, Japan that is a pharmaceutical called, uh, well, PSK or polysaccharide crestine and PSP, polysaccharide peptine, that both come out of turkey tail and they're used heavily with cancer protocol. So here's a mushroom that has those kind of great benefits. Awesome. Um, one that I would say is most commonly used alongside that. It's the one that most people are working with if they're going through cancer treatment. Although much of the science that I've read says that using a multi mushroom, not just turkey tail, like reishi, chaga, and turkey tail together is more effective than just a single. So my recommendation, if I was in that situation, is I would go with one jar of turkey tail and one jar of the five mushroom blend, and I'd take both together. So you're double dosing or triple dosing the turkey tail and getting some of the other ones to go with it. Okay, next mushroom I wanna talk about, and our kind of our last mushroom of the day to really kind of dive into is cordyceps. Now, I love this mushroom. I think it's underutilized. This is a little cordyceps here, by the way, this is a little caterpillar. Um, the ones that we work with are actually cordyceps militaris. The reason is, and again, it's back to the science, cordyceps sinensis, which is the original one that was um, discovered as having health benefits. Uh, it doesn't produce fruiting body when grown on a vegetarian substrate. It needs to be grown on caterpillars or silkworms. And that's the only way it can actually produce a fruiting body. And even so, very little. So I've definitely seen it. I've tried the Cordyceps sinensis of the wild. It's very, very expensive. We're talking about like $32,000 a kilo or more. So all the Cordyceps you're going to get on the market is vegetarian. In Asia, they've been all shifting over from what was called CS4 or Cordyceps sinensis 4, which is a strain of Cordyceps, into Cordyceps militaris, which is known as the dragon cordyceps because they're looking for bioactives in the chemistry. They're looking for cordycepine and adenosine. And these are really important compounds that give cordyceps those qualities that we know of cordyceps. And so you don't get them if they're not in the fruiting bodies. So mycelium of cordyceps doesn't produce any of these compounds. So really what you need is the fruiting body. Hence why we now work with cordyceps militaris because it is the most bioactive. And we work with a strain of cordyceps militaris that was actually produced in uh, the, the um, how, um, Hung Sao University to be able to produce high volumes of cordycepine and adenosine in order to be more bioactive. So what are those bioactives? What does it do? Well, really this opens up the bronchioles and supports cardiovascular health, improves oxygenation to the cells, and really gives us more endurance and stamina, supporting our cortisol load in our adrenals, and really giving us more Endure, uh, more like stamina energy. So longer drive, more energy, more blood flow, better oxygenation to the muscles. So AKA way better for sports, fight or flight, or as a libido booster. So to really increase fertility and libido. There was a study I saw done on chickens. <clears throat> when fed cordyceps, they produced 30% more eggs. That's a lot more eggs. Uh, so just a little bit of fertility booster right there as evidence just in chickens. Obviously, we're not chickens, but we see a lot of um, evidence that this one increases blood flow for both men and women, but it also increases the capacity to be in our feeling body more because we have better oxygenation all through the cells of our body. So it's a great one for working with that, but we're also starting to see much more science now around some of its um, viral and tumor implications as well. So I think Cordyceps has a bright future with a lot more science coming out. In the conference I was at in 2019, there was about seven or eight speakers on Cordyceps that were really passionate about some of the new science coming out around how Cordyceps is not just a single organism, but it's kind of like this whole ecosystem of organisms when you look at it from a genetic DNA spectrum level. And because of that, it has the capacity to really work with multiple different ways of um, producing different active compounds uh, that we may not be quite aware of yet. So there's a lot more around cordyceps to come, I think. Um, I love this mushroom when paired with reishi. So I like doing a reishi cordyceps combination because I feel like that's calming the lungs down, but opening them up and getting better oxygenation. 
calming the heart down, but giving you more drive, right? So they kind of work like a, a yin and a yang of each other. Um, they're just a great pair. So that's one of my favorite pairs is Reishi Cordyceps for energy, endurance, and stamina, but also for just kind of calming the body down while going into those states. All right. That's a bit on some of the mushrooms. I see that our Q&A is piling up. I'm going to just kind of jump through a couple more slides before I go into the Q&A, and then hopefully we have enough time. Thank you all for joining me with some of this. This is the Cordyceps Militaris. As you see, it's bright orange. We work with this. This is grown in these buckets. Um, so this is one of the only ones we work with that is not grown kind of in a, a semi-wild type state. They use this blue light spectrum to increase the cordyceps growing. And this cordyceps is grown on a organic non-GMO soy, rice, coconut bran fiber base. Now, that is very different from a lot of the cordyceps in China because a lot of them are grown on wheat. And we wanted to avoid the wheat grown cordyceps, not just for allergies, because that's not as big of a deal with the fruiting bodies, but more because the wheat grown cordycepine, they just get really big. So you've got less bioactives, kind of like a lot of the food we eat these days versus wild foods. It's less bioactive, less um, active chemistry, but far more size, right? So we wanted to work with smaller cordyceps that produce higher active compounds. So this substrate was specially designed to really encourage a high quality yield of the best quality cordyceps. So cordyceps is actually our most expensive mushroom that we sell um, because it's so specific in the way it's grown and the substrate is very expensive um, in order to increase and produce the world's highest quality cordyceps. We actually have things like cordycepine and adenosine as measurements on the labels of our product. This to me is huge because nobody else in the market that I've seen have these compounds as actual recognizable, measurable quantities. And these are the main bioactives in this mushroom. So again, looking at fruiting bodies versus mycelium, hopefully I've given you a bit of compelling evidence as to why fruiting bodies are just a better product to work with in your body and, and really what some of the benefits of growing them on the right substrates and extracting them in the right way to make them really bioactive and just the best kind of mushroom product we can work with. Okay, so I'm going to skip this one. This is a bit of a, our, our sourcing. Yes, we do work with some regions of mountainous regions of China. We make sure that they're lab tested and third party tested. If you ever buy a product from Harmonic Arts, um, all the stores can request to get certificates of analysis of our products, which show you a whole breakdown of the microbiological tests that are done, the tests for pesticide residues, the tests for heavy metals that we do. We do all of these tests in order to make sure we have the highest quality, um, best mushroom extracts that are rigorously tested on the market. Okay, so that's some of the difference. We've already talked about a little bit of this um, high quality fruiting bodies, you know, great um, variety of medicinal compounds, long history. We also don't use any fillers or diluters. One of the other challenges with some mushroom products is that they might have like super high amount of beta glucans or polysaccharides, but what they are is an extract of just the polysaccharides. And then the rest of it is filler or diluter or flow agents. So we see a lot of maltodextrin in some of these mushroom products that are out there in the market. Um, we have a full spectrum extract that has not got any of that maltodextrin in it. So it's a little more expensive from our raw material perspectives compared to a lot of other things that you can buy in the world of, you know, Alibaba and um, Amazon and all these other places you can get mushrooms. Um, but a lot of the time they have a lot of fillers in them and a lot of um, they're just measured to an active compound, but they're not a full spectrum extract of the whole mushroom, if that makes sense. Okay. So this is a little bit about the concentrations we work with 12 to one, 10 to one, eight to one, eight to one, seven to one. Um, and the five mushroom is equal parts of each blend. <clears throat> so you get really a well-rounded high potency extract, which really means that you get 12 grams of reishi for every one gram of reishi extract. That's a lot. That's like consuming this whole fruiting body in a couple of capsules. Um, you know. So anyway, something I wanted to mention is capsules. This is new to us. Um, these are brand new to Harmonic Arts and really you know, originally we were an intentionally capsule-free company. We now are an intentionally capsuled company because we realize that um, we want to listen to our customers and you um, 
requested these. People really want to work with our mushrooms because they know they're high potency, but they're capsule eaters and they like to work with capsules. So um, we brought out a mushroom capsule in the last few years in order to make sure, well, the last year, sorry, to make sure that we, it's been two years trying to get these out on the market, um, just to make sure that we have the capacity to support you where you're at if you want to work with capsules. Our same high quality fruiting body extracts that are in our powders are in our capsules. So say hello to the new uh, way you can work with mushrooms from Harmonic Arts. But we do have three different ways to work with them. There's tincture, capsules, and um, powder. My personal favorite, and I know I'm not supposed to have a favorite, is the powder because I think it's the best bang for your buck. You can get far more of it. And I love the taste of most of these mushrooms, as well as it's easy to add into coffee, tea, soups, smoothies, baking. I put it into our kids' pancakes, um, into pie crusts, you name it. We put it in all kinds of stuff. So I love the powders that way. Um, I also like to just eat them on their own sometimes. Also, capsules are just way more convenient for those of you on the go or who have a daily routine and they want to make sure you're getting them every time. The powders tend to be used more intuitively, like, oh, I'm having a coffee, let's put a bit of mushrooms in it. Oh, I'm making a smoothie, let's put a bit of mushrooms in it. Whereas the tinctures and capsules are easier to work with as a routine. I also like the tinctures because they're bioavailable. They're super absorbed within seconds of being used and they have... <clears throat> a bit more of the um, mushroom uh, capacity to really pull out some of those active compounds in the alcohol. So uh, all three are good. Really, which is the best? The one that you're going to take. Um, which way are you more likely to work with your mushrooms? For me, it's powders. For you, it might be capsules. But I also, like when I'm on the go, I was just literally just flew in a couple of days ago from Amsterdam, a biohackers conference I was at. And on the plane, I am chugging a bottle of reishi tincture. I just love it. It's grounding. It's good for pulling out EMFs and radiation. And it just is a great way for me when I'm flying. I like to literally cre create a sipping cordial out of a reishi tincture. It's my favorite, favorite, favorite medicine for airplanes. And that's in a tincture format. Anyway, okay. So thanks for joining me. Um, I want to mention that you know, I'm going to jump into some Q&A. So those of you who want to go, uh, I totally appreciate your time. It is your most valuable resource. Know that we have loads more on mushrooms. We've done a ton of videos. Check out our YouTube channel. Check out our harmonic arts. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, ask our help desk if you have any questions. Uh, we've got a great knowledgeable team. And same with our social media team. They're amazing. Um, we can totally support you with a lot of that. And just know that if you're watching this webinar, you do get the recording and I want you to look for a special offer coming to your inbox. We are going to give you a discount on some of our products just for tuning in with us. So if you sign up for the webinar, know that tomorrow you're going to get a recap email and in it will be a discount um, flash sale for working with mushrooms. So um, hope to uh, tune you into that and hope to see from some of you that want to work with our mushrooms a little bit of a, you get a bit of a discount on your next order. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump in and yeah, thanks for joining me. i um, appreciating you. Um, yeah, let me just tune into the Q&A and see what I can do. Um, yeah, and, and give our community love. <clears throat> um, thanks for, for everyone. All right, so I'm just going to jump into a couple of Q&As here and I'm going to stop my screen share just as the last part of this slide. Check out harmonicarts.ca, follow the socials, check out the YouTube, um, and may the spores be with you. Live long and pro spore, my friends. <laughs> All right. So is it may, may the forest be with you? May the spores be with you? Live long and pro spore, whichever kind of fun thing you want to share. Um, hit me up for some mushroom jokes if you guys want to hear something funny, like what kind of musician is a mushroom? It's a decomposer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, okay. So first question here is um, what mushrooms help with irritable bowel syndrome and anxiety from Marie? Yeah. And, and please, if you've worked with our mushrooms, uh, throw some chat love and let the other folks watching the webinar know some of the ways you like to work with mushrooms. Um, but yeah, Marie, so what mushrooms are good for irritable bowel? Well, honestly, all of the polysaccharide rich mushrooms that are like polypores like reishi, chaga, and turkey tail 
are all really helpful for that. These are all really prebiotics. This is very different from probiotics, right? Probiotics are the actual gut bacteria that live in your intestinal tract. Think of permaculture farming and think of permaculture gut design. Working with prebiotics is more about creating leaf litter and permaculture nurturing the soil of your gut to help with irritable bowel stuff, right? This is how we really want to culture and build resilience. It's not probiotics, it's prebiotics, right? Building that up and Mushrooms have these great polysaccharides that work as like master prebiotics, really helping calm down the inflammation and increase the absorption and really create a better environment for many of our uh, microbiological friends to procreate and create a healthy, happy homes for them in their ecosystem. So that's what we really want to do. We don't just want to send in pre probiotics with a whole lot of like energy that is just going to get robbed and taken advantage of. We want to create the environment in which they can grow. So reishi would be my favorite, but chaga and turkey tail, Marie, they're also pretty good. Okay. Um, Aaron Roman is asking, I've heard there are different medicinal qualities to different varieties of reishi. However, I usually only see reishi on the label to distinguish the difference. Yeah. Great question. Love that. Um, there are totally different qualities. Um, I've got a Ganoderma sinensis here. This is the black reishi. In China, this is considered the reishi for more jing, more building of um, the batteries of the, our, like the ancestral chi that we came into life with, right? So more restorative, whereas red reishi is more considered to be heart opening or xian or protecting the cardiovascular system and for helping us live in the heart, more meditative in that sense. Uh, but there are a number of the, like the brown reishi of the Ganoderma, Aplanatums, these have much more antibacterial properties. So there are definitely subtleties. The Ganoderma organensi, which is our local reishi here, has a lot of other really cool active compounds as well in it. Uh, the, the challenge is a lot of the science originally done on red reishi was actually done on um, like a Ganoderma lucidium or Ganoderma, like another Ganoderma lynchi. And so there's a number of those that they actually don't know what they were studying in the early days because they now have genetically seen that they're actually different, but they have similar properties. Okay, so um, hopefully that helps answer a bit of that. There are differences. Most of the time, though, it's red reishi that has been heavily studied, and that is Ganoderma lucidium or Ganoderma lynchi. Those are the two ones that are considered red reishi. And that's what you're mostly going to find in products. That's what's mostly cultivated, we'll say. But in the wild, you're going to find all different ones. And even like, here's a Ganoderma I have. This is a Ganoderma that is grown by a friend of mine. And it's grown in a CO2 environment. So it produces more of these antlers. And these antlers have a totally different type of um, higher triterpene content than the fruiting body does, right? So two totally different things, same species, but different bioactives based on how they're grown and what they're grown on. So it, it's, it, you know, it can be a bit of a wormhole the further you go in. Okay, next question is um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, there's lots of info on immune system regulating mushrooms provided, but I'm wondering about hormone regulation. Yeah, great question. Um, I will say that Mushrooms like reishi that kind of recalibrate and rebalance the body are going to help the hormonal systems regulate themselves. I've seen a number of women work with reishi as far as female um, hormonal monthly cycles to support them, but there are a lot of other herbs that work in that way too. And when we're looking at the whole endocrine system in general and the horror sort of hormonal lens, um, we're going to want to look to some of the things that I like to work with are both mushrooms and seaweeds in helping to modulate that, right? To balance that out. But if you're looking for very specific actions like um, cortisol and stress balance, maybe it's just cordyceps, or maybe it's starting to ad add some adaptogens in there. If you're looking for thyroid, okay, maybe it's seaweeds. And then depending on if it's hypo or hyperthyroid, you might be looking at motherwort or bugleweed or other herbs like that or things that are gonna calm down the thyroid. So you might have to look a little deeper into the specifics of each system of hormones. If it's female hormones, 
one thing to think about if it's like estrogen and and the balance there, then you're going to want to think about how the liver is working with breaking down and detoxifying these hormones as well. So some of that support might be into liver health with things like burdock and dandelion and a little bit more artichoke and things that are going to squeeze the liver in to make it function better, right? So there's a lot more to think about there. And then also, depending on if it's female hormones, you've got uterine tonics. So something like Harmonic Arts female tonic our female tincture would be a great place to start. Um, and then adding in a five mushroom blend to help modulate the overall system. That would be kind of where I'd start. Um, but again, case specific, right? So hopefully that is helpful. Okay, Christine is asking, um, would you say that mushroom tincture is stronger than the powder of the capsule? I think the mushroom tincture is slightly stronger, but bang for your buck, the mushroom powder is got more in it. You get more bang for your buck. Capsules more convenient. The tincture, yeah, slightly, slightly stronger uh, in some ways. Okay, Tina is asking which substrate is best for increasing the amount of beneficial compounds versus speeding the growth and yield of the flushes. Well, it really depends on the mushroom, right? Each mushroom is individual. Um, often, a log-grown mushroom is going to have more beneficial active compounds if it's a log naturalized mushroom like turkey tail, reishi, chaga, right? It's not grown on that. It's not going to have those beneficial compounds. With cordyceps, it had to like kind of hack the substrates. And so that's why having a protein rich substrate like the one we work with mirrors an insect, right? Because cordyceps grows on an insect. So trying to create a substrate that mirrors the insect in order to produce those bioactives is super important, right? Okay, a um, couple other questions here. Let's just, so it's, it's individual by individual. Do mushrooms have um, health side effects or allergies, Chris is asking. Many of your food mushrooms do. So when you're eating button mushrooms or portobello mushrooms, there's lots of antifungal compounds or there's lots of fungal exacerbating compounds. So they might create more inflammation. They might create more allergies if you have fungus infections already in the body. Many of the medicinal mushrooms, there's very, very little. I think with reishi, the only thing they've ever really found is if people are on blood thinners, uh, this can naturally lower the blood pressure. And so they might need to reduce their blood thinners. So they might have a side effect to their blood thinners when they start taking reishi. Um, but generally they're very, very safe, at least with many of the polypores that we can work with. Okay, let's see how many questions. Oh no, I always do this. There's like a good 10 more questions. So let me see if I can um, answer a couple of these quick. Um, because I do want to honor your time and I only want to stay on here for another 10 minutes just to make sure that I don't overstep that boundary of, hey, you guys got other things to do. We all have um, lives. So just appreciating you, those of you who want to stay on for some of the questions. Okay, Gord is asking, what resources would you use to learn more about mushrooms? Great question. Um, love that. What resources? Where should we look further? Well, one of my favorite authors is this guy, Martin Powell. Um, I have his book right here. Martin Powell does a clinical guide to medicinal mushrooms. I think he's great. Um, David Aurora writes two awesome books. I really love his books. Um, he's got Mushrooms Demystified, and it's like a book this thick, super huge. He also writes All the Rain Promises and more, and it's a little field guide. You can learn about lots of the mushrooms you might want to harvest. Another one is Robert Rogers. He's a great um, mycologist from Alberta. He writes one called Fungal Pharmacy. And it's great because it talks about a lot of the different mushrooms. He also has one called, uh, I think it's mushrooms, um, like a human clinical trials of working with medicinal mushrooms. That's another one, but his fungal pharmacy is definitely the book to go to. And that's Robert Rogers. Um, love his books. Um, he's run and written a number. Um, let's see, my favorite mushroom book as of late is one from a guy named Merlin Sheldrake. And it was amazing. It's brand new. I just got on an Audible's like, I don't know, six months ago. It just came out six months ago. I literally was, as soon as it came out, I got it. Um, and it's called An Entangled Life. And it goes into the whole concepts of the wood wide web and a little deeper into all this stuff. And Merlin Sheldrake is just a beautiful author, has a great perspective on working with um, life on this planet and how, Mushrooms fit into this really intricate intelligence, both as medicine, as um, ecosystem builders, and as maybe potential future support for the health of our whole planet and our minds and so much more. So those are a couple of books. 
that's all I can talk about right now. But know that a mushroom uh, library, I definitely have at least a dozen more mushroom books that I've loved over the years beyond those ones. Um, but really, if you're going to forage, get a good field guide. If you want to learn about medicinals, um, get something like fungal pharmacy. If you want to learn about ecosystem and overall mushroom health, Merlin Sheldricks and Entangled Life is great. Okay. <clears throat> Pam is asking another question around, um, is there a form, i.e. extract, powder, et cetera, that is ideal for maximizing bioavailability? I think the powder or the tincture are really the two best ways. An extract is far better than just a one-to-one -one powder. I, I mentioned this earlier, but a lot of the products on the market are just a one-to-one -one powder and you're eating ground up mushrooms that have been heat treated. It's really hard to make those fully bioavailable and really you're getting just a lot of fiber, which is, there's lots of other places to get fiber that's not even, is nowhere near as expensive as mushrooms. Um, it's good fiber in them for sure when you're eating ground up powder mushrooms, but you really want those health benefits. So an extract that's like a juice powder of a tincture, which is what we do, that's really bioavailable in water that could be just put into tea and turned into a hot tea. That is the best way to work with mushrooms or a tincture. So those are the two best ones, Pam, that I would suggest. June is asking um, if turkey tail has a bit of green on it, it maybe moss starting from around. Um, can I still use it? Uh, I've grown it from a bag. Yeah, I'm from Grow Mushrooms Canada. Yes, totally. I've made tea with green ish colored turkey tail. Um, just make sure that you cook it well. If, if any of that is like secondary um, fungal infection or secondary moss growing on top of it, make sure you give it a good simmer. So you're killing any pathogenic potential E. coli or staph or I don't know what's on there, but I just, I don't want to recommend, yes, you can take it unless you properly sterilize it, so to speak, by giving it a light boil, light simmer um, for a good 20 minutes. Um, yeah. So that would be my suggestion, June. If you're growing it, totally use it. And yes, it's totally fine if you give it a light simmer. These compounds in turkey tail, they're pretty darn stable. Branch polysaccharides are going to last a long time. Some of the polyphenols you might burn off if you boil it too long, um, but you're going to get the main immune modulating properties. Okay. Um, Sharon is asking, um, uh, I've been reading research related to heart issues, in particular heart um, palmitations, I think she means palpitations, and how cordyceps um, can um, provide uh, very helpful for this area. Can you share any insight on this? Yeah, well, cordyceps opens the bronchioles and gets better oxygenation. So really getting better oxygenation into the blood is how it works. It gives more um, capacity for blood to uptake oxygen and for the lungs to expand and get more in there. So when it comes to improving cardiovascular health, it's really all about oxygenating the blood properly so that it's easier for it to move around the body and it's it's healthier. And, and so for heart issues, depending on if the heart issues around the musculature of the heart, I, I feel like cordyceps would still help that. Um, again, I would be using cordyceps and reishi because reishi is shown to strengthen the heartbeat, you know, and, and just calm it down and strengthen it. So I just think I'd be using both together. Okay. Um, let me see how many, I got a few more questions here, guys. Um, I want to just cap it here. So I'm going to answer just a couple more. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Tina is asking, which substrate is best for growing and getting the most yield and beneficial compounds from lion's mane and, and reishi? Logs, grow them on logs if you can. I'm growing lion's mane right now on logs. I'm growing reishi in a couple of stumps in my yard. Um, and um, someone mentioned Grow Mushrooms Canada. We've partnered with them before. They're great. They've got great substrates you can inoculate into logs. You can grow them in bags. Um, they are using a hardwood sawdust, so a hardwood sawdust in a bag is just as good, but a log, um, it just has more uh, to it. So that would be my ideal. Sawdust bags, though, are definitely easier, and you definitely get better maximization of mycelium contact. So if you're a novice, grow them in bags. If you can, grow them on logs um, to get better concentration of bioactives. Okay, um, let's see. Um, June is asking, is there a type of person energy-wise that does not react well to using reishi? Although it seems to help me, I know two per people who seem to feel like they are running inside when they use it. Yeah, I've heard this once or twice before too, that 
Reishi is a little strong for some people. For most people, it's calming down, right? It's really bringing them back into their body. But I'm curious about this because it's not the first time I've heard this. I've heard this like very scarcely, but that a couple of people find Reishi is maybe not um, the best medicine for them. I'm a really big believer in like, you are intuitive and you know your body better than anyone. So don't take my word for it. If if it doesn't feel right in your body, don't take it. Like, but give it a try and then also reproof that for yourself. Like, don't just, oh, I took it once. It's not good for me. Um, Rishi usually takes 30 days before it really starts working in calming down the mind. So sometimes what people might be doing is taking it for one or two days and they're having stuff come up because they haven't actually dealt with this stuff in the past. And so my invitation is to stick through it. Just like when somebody quits an addiction, it's really uncomfortable for a couple of days and then it gets way more comfortable. Uh, you may find that this might be a initial, not healing crisis, but an initial reaction that changes over time. So definitely listen to your own body and how it feels when working with stuff like this. But at the same time, with things that you know take a little bit of time to really have those benefits, you may want to try and stick through a week or two before making a full, accurate decision on, is this beneficial for me? And last thing I'll say about that is that most of these mushrooms really become beneficial when you take them regularly, right? When you're taking them for two to three weeks at a time. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think. That's it. I'm going to leave it here. Um, appreciating you. And just know that this is not the last time we can connect on mushrooms. I love to share more about mushrooms. So, um, you know, hit me up um, and or um, check out some of our other webinars. Know that Harmonic Arts Live is our webinar site. So you can go back and look at any of our old webinars there at harmonicartslive.ca. I think it is. Maybe it's not com, but you'll find it. Um, Harmonic Arts Live is where we keep all our webinars. We like to share information. We're a herbalist-based company, right? We're not a profit-first company. We're a people-first and planet-first and then profit. So commonly, the way we go about sharing is to try and give you as much information as possible. So we've got loads of webinars. We're also supporting the Vancouver Island, or the both the Vancouver Island, but also the Canadian Herb Conference. So I just want to give you a quick heads up, last thing I'll mention here is if you can join us this year, November 3rd through the 6th um, for the Canadian Herb Conference, this is going to be one of the best events online of our time. I just We've done this twice now, and it's an amazing collection of over 40 herbalists, great herbal minds. Harmonic Arts is a major sponsor, and we are continually trying to support you becoming more uh, knowledgeable around working with plants, around creating your own best health practice. And it's not all about buying our products. It's really about creating an ecosystem of lifestyle design that really supports you in finding your best self ever. And that's really what we're here to be, is a medicine bridge towards your best life ever. Okay, thanks for joining us. Um, have a wonderful day and we will see you next time. All right, ciao for now. Oh, I've got to stop sharing. <laughs>